Well, it's, it's great to have you with us tonight as we reflect upon the meaning of Christmas. So let's start with a really important bit of it. How are you getting on with your present list to Santa, eh? Because that, of course, is what Christmas is all about. Last week, a man from Reading was reunited with the letter he wrote to Santa 70 years ago. It was stuck up the chimney of the house he'd grown up in until builders were pulling down the chimney stack and they found it. Of course, children don't write letters to Santa anymore, do they? It's emails now. Dear Santa, you seemed to have trouble getting my bike and tractor last year. Have you tried Amazon.com? <laughs> Love, Sam Perrins. Dear Santa, last year I, I got a sister for Christmas instead of a bike. Maybe some other boy wanted a sister and, and got my bike. We have kept the sister, but I still want a bike. <laughs> Love, Ben Archer. And then there was this request from an adventurous eight-year-old. Dear Santa, if you can fix it for me... Can I travel to the moon? Love, Tim Peak. <laughs> Tim Peak. He's been all over our news this week, hasn't he? The, the British astronaut who, uh, who right now is 250 uh, miles above us somewhere on the International Space Station. He may not have got to the moon as an eight-year-old, but on Wednesday, inside the small capsule of a a Soyuz rocket, he blasted off, accelerating from naught to a thousand miles per hour in 60 seconds. Now that's the kind of car I'd like for Christmas myself. And eight minutes later, Tim Peake was free from the Earth's orbit. What a view! What a journey! With the Force awakened in that Star Wars movie, space is box office. So, the opening video, that sequence that began our program tonight, couldn't be more relevant, could it? Have you ever looked up at the night sky and thought, wow, there's a lot of stars out there? Douglas Adams, in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, says it all for us. Space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean... You think that it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. Peanuts, indeed. Try this on for size. Our sun sits inside the galaxy we call the Milky Way, but that's not the only one in the universe. A few years ago, the powerful uh, Hubble telescope discovered what was believed to be just another bit of empty blackness out there somewhere in space. But that single patch turned out to be filled with the flickering dots of 10,000 separate galaxies. In fact, if on your way home tonight you look up at the stars and place a grain of sand on the tip of your finger and hold it out to the horizon in the sky above you, in that tiny black space are some of those galaxies. A hundred billion of them Astronomers reckon in the visible universe, each one with a hundred billion stars. That means that there are more stars than there are grains of sand on the earth. No wonder that writer Douglas Adams jokingly said that the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything is the number 42. But what's the ultimate question of life? I think this, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there existence at all? Why are we here? In 1971, Apollo 15 astronaut James Irwin became the eighth man to walk on the moon. But on his return to Earth, Irwin said this, the greatest miracle is not that man walked upon the moon, but that God walked upon the earth. That's the meaning of Christmas. The staggering claim of the Christian faith is that in Jesus of Nazareth, the creator of those 100 billion galaxies and stars became part of his creation. He walked upon the earth. So, so why would the God who created the universe want to come to this 
tennis ball of a planet and be born in a feeding trough for animals. So reflect with me, will you, upon firstly, the surprise of the stable. We're, we're with Luke now, not Luke Skywalker, but Luke, the gospel writer. 19,000 words he takes to tell the story of the life of Jesus, yet only a couple of paragraphs to cover his birth. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to his own town to register. Straight away, you see, Luke wants us to realize that we are reading history here, not a George Lucas science fiction if I, if I had to invent a story about God sending the most important person who has ever lived into our world, the one who was meant to show what, what the creator was like, I wouldn't kick it off with the scandal of a teenage pregnancy and of a birth in total obscurity. I'd at least make sure it had some cultural credibility but, but here's the extraordinary thing about the birth of Jesus. You get nothing like that. In fact, quite the opposite. Nothing you'd expect to happen, happened. And, and many things you'd never expect to happen, did. While they were there, Joseph and Mary, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The stable was a surprise to, to Mary and Joseph. I can't imagine that that's the way they would have planned it. The impact of the stable birth would have surprised the great Caesar Augustus. He thought he was king of the world, pushing people like chess pieces around a chessboard. But he was actually moving into place a baby who would checkmate every emperor who's ever lived. As God slips into the stream of history, how silently the wondrous gift is given. If, as Christianity claims Jesus was sent by, by God to reveal God, then the nature of his birth tells us something amazing about, about what this God must be like. More than monumental power and size. Of course, make no mistake, God is big, but he's also personal and humble, so humble that he enters his creation in a shed and... His early life is that of a refugee. Have I ever told you that I once met Doctor Who? Well, the David Tennant version of the Doctor, anyway. He was filming a, a Christmas edition with, with Billy Piper in the streets around the church in Cardiff, where, where I was working at the time. And for a whole week, we found ourselves part of a, a kind of giant film set. And then, all alone, on the corner of the street... I saw it, the TARDIS, that familiar blue police call box. Now, the one thing that everyone knows about the TARDIS is that it's so much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And for 48 years, I believed that. But when I opened the blue door and looked in, it was smaller than my garden shed. And there on the floor was a wooden chair, a discarded sandwich, and a shoe on a foot belonging to a man who glanced up at me and said, Hello, 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 my son. Can I help you? Let me tell you the painful truth. The TARDIS is not bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. If you've been attending Lansdowne in the last few years, you will know that C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. He's the author of, among other things, of course, the Narnia Chronicles. Well, in the last battle, the Narnians are under siege from their enemies, and they're being chased up a hill where they find a stable into which they are all stampeded, led by King Tyrion, who, unlike most of Narnia's royalty, has never traveled between worlds. So, Tyrion peers back through the stable door to see outside the fading fire beside the stable. He's watching Narnia 
on its last evening. And, and this is how Lewis described what happens next. Tyrion looked around again and could hardly believe his eyes. There was blue sky overhead and grassy country spreading as far as he could see in every direction. It seems then, said Tyrion, that the stable scene from within and the stable scene from without are two different places. Yes, said Lord Diggory, its inside is bigger than its outside. Yes, said Queen Lucy, in our world too, a stable once had something inside it that was bigger than our whole world. There's Christmas in a nutshell. The surprise of the stable. The maker of the stars and sea became a child on earth for me. A stable once had something inside it that was bigger than our whole world bigger than a billion galaxies. Not a something, but a someone. God, the creator of stars and planets and black holes and matter and molecules, that is the surprise of the stable. But why can we believe that? How can we believe that? Reflect with me secondly. Not on the surprise of the stable, but on the announcement of the angel. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, said the angel to the the shepherds on the hillside. And that announcement tells us about the identity of Jesus. He's no ordinary boy, announced the angels. He is Christ, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew Messiah, It means the special one, the anointed king of the ages. But he's even more than that. This Christ is also Lord. That's the name Hebrews give to God himself. The baby in the manger is God. That's the claim. And there's no no other way to, to read it. But the angel's announcement tells us, secondly, about the destiny of Jesus. He is born to rescue. He's not just king of the world. Jesus is savior of the world. I don't think anyone tonight can seriously doubt that the world that we live in needs a savior. Just this past year, the earthquake in Nepal, the the Paris attacks, the Syrian refugee crisis, the the terrorism of ISIL. Our world needs saving. Where a lot of us struggle is to accept that we personally need a savior because most of us behave as if we can sort out our own mess, really. Just imagine for a moment that your life was was turned into a a book or or better, a film, a movie of everything you've ever done, said and thought, and as you put the film on, there's, there's some pretty positive stuff there. You've tried your best. You've helped people. You've, you've given to charity. You've, you've turned up to a carol service in church. Well, in a school. But then as you continue watching, there, there, there's, there's footage which, which you're ashamed of. There's the people you've ignored and, and failed to love. There's the selfishness and the pride It's a relief that no one except you really knows about that sort of stuff. Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, once played a prank on 12 of the most respectable people he knew who were living in London. He sent them a telegram that simply said, flee, all is revealed. Within 24 hours, six had left the country. I can relate to that. Can you? There's much in my life that I never want to be revealed. That's why we need a savior. So there is good news of great joy for all people, for those who think they are too good to be saved, because we're not, and those who think they are too bad to be saved, because we can't be. The truth is, we all need a savior. And in our heart of hearts, I think we know that. But according to the angel's announcement, 
Jesus is also good news because he is the peacemaker between us and God, between our world and heaven. What do they say? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those upon whom God's favor rests. Peace on earth. Peace in us. Wouldn't that be a, a transformation? And that's the heart of Christmas. And it's the theme of our final carol. So as the music group comes uh, to the stage, we're, we're going to sing about the, the peace that Christ can bring to a broken world and broken people. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Let's stand and sing that carol together. <laughs>